Hi everyone, it's Chris again. I hope you're not all as sick of hearing me talk as I am of hearing myself. Um, because we've got some exciting more stuff to talk about. This section is about beta diversity. And here we will be introducing some tools for calculating and visualizing beta diversity measures. Um, if you remember, beta diversity is between sample diversity. Um, so how does the composition of this sample compare to the composition of this sample using some metric of diversity, right? Um, we will be exploring the emperor plots that we built back in the core metrics phylogenetic section. Um, we're going to run the chime diversity beta group significance and chime diversity adonis actions. And we are going to use the resulting visualizations to really like poke around with the, the structure of our microbial communities, beta diversity, right? Um, I think we're going to learn some cool stuff here. And I think this is going to be a kind of a really fun part of the tutorial. So just like in the last section, during which we talked about alpha diversity, um, we are going to be using data artifacts and visualizations produced by core metrics to produce new visualizations and find new ways to talk about diversity and learn about diversity. Um, and again, just like the alpha diversity section, we are mostly going to be using our visualizations for exploration, um, trying to find ways of easily visually detecting patterns and things in our data um, in ways that we can't really do by just looking at numbers. Um, and we will use the, the statistics generated by these, these methods to like quantify and test our hypothesis in ways that we can talk about and publish. Um, I think we can kind of dive right in. We were, we're gonna be starting like right out of the gate with questions this time. Um, and that's really, that's kind of a fun way to do it. Um, and we can do that because we've already created the visualizations that we're going to be using. So rather than going straight to the terminal, I'm going to head back to the files I've got stored on the workshop server. I'm going to click into core metrics results. You'll recognize this file by now, uh, this directory. Um, and we're going to grab a couple of our Unifrac Emperor plots. You can see that these are QZVs, the visualizations. Um, and they're both really nicely and easily named, so we shouldn't have too much trouble finding them. Just as before, I'm just copying these URLs, pasting them into Chime 2 View, and you should be able to follow along pretty easily. And also, just like in the Alpha Diversity section, I'm going to be opening up two tabs with two visualizations side by side. And like I said before, that can be really helpful because it allows us to compare and contrast two different metrics to see what we can learn kind of at, when we zoom out and look what those metrics themselves mean, right? We can see that starting from the same data, we've produced two remarkably different plots here. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start this one by kind of asking the questions and then we'll get into these visualizations. We'll look at what they are and how they work a little bit mechanistically. Um, and then we'll try to answer some questions, right? Um, so first question is in the unweighted Unifrac Emperor plot, can you find separation in the data? If so, can you find a metadata factor that reflects the separation? What if we used Unifrac distance or weighted Unifrac? Um, so we can kind of dive right into this. When we look at this unweighted Unifrac plot, it immediately jumps out to my eye, and I'm sure to yours as well, as well, that we have two clusters of points here, right? And this big gap separating them. Um, so right here along this axis one, we do very clearly have a separation. Um, what that separation means is kind of why this emperor plot exists. And so I'm gonna zoom out a little bit and we'll talk about what, what we're looking at here. Um, 
Emperor is a tool that allows us to plot principal coordinates analysis of our data. Um, it takes in a distance matrix, if I'm remembering correct. Well, that's not true. It takes in a PicoA data set. Um, and that PicoA data set is calculated from a distance matrix, which is calculated using unweighted unifrac in this case, or weighted unifrac in the other case, or whatever other beta diversity metric you prefer. Um, the way this plot is designed, it is interactive. So you have the ability to really pan around these three most important axes in your data. Um, these are the axes selected by the model, which are most, which contribute most heavily to difference in the data. Um, and when we open a new emperor plot, by default, it opens in an orientation that best represents or maximizes the amount of like spread or separation in the data. Um, so whenever you open this, you kind of start with a, an optimal picture. Um, and, and panning around can just give you different views of data in your metadata that can sometimes be useful. Um, so like, here we are, we're looking at this thing, we found the separation. And we're supposed to we're supposed to find out whether there is a, um, a metadata category that describes that separation well. There are a lot of tools for doing that here. You'll see a, a whole list of them along this menu on the right. Um, and we're going to start with color because color is a really quick and easy way to see patterns in data. Um, if I, for example, color by cage ID. Cage 31 is represented by these points in red. Cage 43 is represented by these points in green. This is notably a categorical variable in our data. Um, so using these categorical colorings, like this color palette that is designed for that, is a really reasonable way of looking at this data. If, on the other hand, we were looking at days post-transplant, using one of these sequential colorings might make more sense. In this case, we don't see a clear pattern, but if we had a trend visible over time, you might be able to track the low values moving into high values in a pattern of increasing color gradient in one direction or another, right? Um, so if we imagine Let's pretend we're doing a study on uh, temperature, and we see that diversity increases according to temperature. We might see, as these temperature values increase, a gradient in the in the scatter plot on on the visualization from this. Right. We're going to step back to these classic Chime two colors because um, we're not working with continuous data here. Um, and we're going to start looking at some of these other categories to see if we've got anything. We see some clustering with cage, um, but there's still a lot of mixing. We see, uh, let's look at genotype. Genotype is really important to this study. This is probably where I would start, actually, if I were just doing this, this exploratory work on my own. And again, we see some clusters here, but nothing that's really clear cut and matches this big separation. If on the other hand, we look at donor or donor status, it becomes immediately apparent that all of our healthy mice plot here with one outlier exception. Um, and all of our PD mice, all of our, our humanized mice plot over here. So there's, there, the difference in our data is being explained very well by donor status. What is that outlier? I'm not really sure. It, it's possible that this is the same outlier that has shown up in other places. If I click on that point, it's possible to get, and you see at the lower left, the sample ID of that outlier point. Um, and so you can go back and look at your metadata and see exactly, you know, which cage that came from, 
how it was treated, if there are any other unique things about it. You can check your lab notes and figure out whether maybe there was a contamination event with that one sample um, or something happened that was unexpected there. Um, and so being able to look into these points lets you look back and just make sure that everything's buttoned up on the experimental side. So we can do really similar things um, with shape, for example, where we color or let's say we, um, we shape based on genotype. And this allows you to look at more than one of your metadata categories in one plot. You can use size, scale to do similar things, scaling up certain categories or scaling things according to a data value. Um, visibility allows you to drop things out what I'm wrestling with right now, though, is that some of these some of these blue uh, points they just don't stand out super well to my eye, um, and especially if I were going to try to make this into a publication figure, I would probably want this oriented with a white background and a and a colored foreground. Um, and so if we click over on axes, this is where a lot of the controls are for kind of the, the visualizations components. We can swap the axis and label colors to black and the background color to white. And all of a sudden, we've got a, a slightly more um, contrasty way of looking at the same visualization. Um, Another really neat tool that we can use here, let's say that we really only want to picture the two most important axes. I can drop out that third axis and look at this in kind of like square two dimensions, which makes it really easy to visualize the two most important dimensions. Um, and then, for example, save our image as a vector or raster for publication um, or even if I if I have uh, strong feelings about how this looks and I'm willing to put in the time to learn a little bit um, I can open this image with Vega which is a kind of a visualization editing tool and on a very fine-grained level manipulate how each one of these points is represented and then output the figure that I want While we're in here playing with the nuts and bolts of this visualization, um, I'd like to show you guys one more thing. That is this save and load current settings feature. You can, you know, if you remember, when we first jumped into this visualization, it didn't tell us a whole lot, right? It just reloaded the visualization so we can see it as it was originally. Um, but let's say we find something that's really interesting and want to communicate it quickly to a reviewer, a PI, uh, a collaborator. We can save the settings and send those settings to our PI alongside the visualization. And then they can load them and see exactly what we were seeing after configuring this thing in the way to, that best represents what we see in the data. All right, I think that's a pretty deep dive into emperor plots. Um, there are other lots of other things that you can do here. Um, animations are possible in this tool, which is pretty remarkable. Um, and we'll see those a little bit later when we talk about longitudinal study. But I think it's time to get back to the core of what we're doing, which is trying to understand our data and answer questions about our hypothesis, right? So if we step back to these questions, We've looked at our unweighted unifrac emperor plot. We found a clear separation in the data. We found a metadata factor, donor, that reflects that separation very clearly. What if we looked at weighted unifrac? Tellingly, we also have a clear separation here. It's not as strong. You can see that Though that separation exists, it's, it's nowhere near as significant as the separation in unweighted unifrac. 
What that allows us to do is consider these two different metrics side by side and, and maybe better understand why our community separates differently in those two different metrics. So if you remember from the lecture, the difference between weighted and unweighted unifrac, you'll know that weighted unifrac takes into account the relative frequency of the features represented in the data. And the fact that we're seeing less separation in this weighted plot than we do in the unweighted plot suggests that maybe in the unweighted plot, which arguably overrepresents rare, like infrequent features, um, some of this dis difference is coming from all of those smaller feature counts, right? These are, these are the occasional uh, one, two, three, ten, ten count features in our, in our subsample data. Whereas in the weighted unifrac, we see a little less difference because the most prominent features are present in both communities. Um, and so that is kind of washing out some of that difference that we see in the smaller features. Now, I don't know that that's true, but that seems like a reasonable way to interpret the plot. Um, and it's a, it's a thing that we can kind of carry with us as we keep thinking about our data. So another really useful thing that we can use these, these visualizations for is trying to find patterns um, that indicate bias, right? So imagine you have done all of the sample collection and sequencing and um, live animal work that goes into a mouse study. There are a number of places where bias can creep in. It can creep in um, from co-housing animals in the same cage. Uh, it can creep in during sequencing. If you had multiple sequencing runs, differences in how those runs proceeded could produce differences in the way the data actually rendered. Um, and so using making sure that we track in our metadata things like um, cage ID for each mouse and which sequencing run a sample came from, et cetera, um, which extraction group some given sample was in, allows us to look at those things really quickly and see whether we're getting the same kind of clustering or whether we're getting a, a coloring that describes some separation in the data, right? Here with cage ID, we do see some clustering, you know, the, the blues and reds and yellows are kind of all together and the greens and yellows and purples are all together. Um, but I suspect that there, you know, there's a lot of mixing of colors, right? And I suspect that that separation is much better explained by donor than it is by cage. You could run some statistics and quantify your, um, your cage effect, essentially. And we may find that there is cage effect in this study that is important. But for now, it, it doesn't look like we have a cage effect problem. Now, as I'm sure you guys all recognize, um, Though we're getting some really amazing insights really quickly just by looking at these emperor plots, these are qualitative insights. I can't tell you, for example, how different these two things are. I just can tell you that there's clearly some separation along axis one of this principal coordinate set. Um, so we're going to move on and start getting into trying to quantify the trends that we see here. Um, we're going to do that first with Permanova. Permanova is a hypothesis test, and it tests whether samples within a group are more similar to each other than they are to samples in like between groups. Um, and that will let us ask about the significance of our hypothesis, essentially. It allows to test our hypothesis. Um, about genotype and its relationship with diversity. I have copied these commands. I have 
failed to log into the workshop server, so I'm going to do that again real quick. Ooh, ooh, not winning any points this time. All right, we're back in business. So we've got our workshop directory. I'll cd into workshop. I'll look around. Um, and let's just walk through these commands real quick. A lot of this is going to look very familiar. These are very simple commands in terms of the inputs that they take. We need a distance matrix, which we will get from core metrics. We need the same metadata TSV that we've been using. We need to choose a column in that metadata that we care about, right? So here we're looking at donor because donor is the, the covariate that's shown us the strongest trends so far. Um, a little farther down, we'll try another one. We'll look at cage, um, but you could run the same, the same uh, commands using genotype if you felt that genotype was um, had a lot of potential as a, an important factor here, right? Um, donor shows a stronger signal in this data set, and so that's what we'll start with. But obviously, if this were a if this were your study, you would probably look at them all. Looks like I did a weird thing. Somewhere in the process of copy pasting this, I produced something strange. Core metrics result, weighted unifract donor significance.qzv squiggle.qzv. Um, and that's probably not a problem. It's probably just a funny file name. Yep, so here we are with .qzv.qzv. Um, I'm going to rerun that command so that we can get rid of that guy. First, I'm going to remove the old one um, because I don't want like extra stuff hanging around. And I just have to remember that I'm still in the workshop directory and I'm removing something from within a subdirectory. So I have to give the file path, the relative file path to my weighted unifrac donor significance QZV QZV. And there we go. That's all cleaned up. And I'm going to once again Copy this command, hit enter, and we're in business. I will copy the second one. We'll do the same thing. Navigate back to the server, refresh, and we've got a weighted unifract donor significance and an unweighted unifract donor significance that we can bring up in Q2 view. So here we are looking at 
our unweighted unifrac significance um, on the grouped by donor. And what I mean when I say that is we are grouping our samples by donor and then running a permutation test uh, using permanova on those samples um, and specifically on the unweighted unifrac distances of those samples. This summary table at the top tells us essentially about the test that we have run. We know that we use permanova, that the test statistic is a pseudo f, that our sample size is 47, so there are 47 samples in our, uh, in our test, and that we have two groups, right? We have the control and we have the humanized Parkinson's mice, right? This is where we get into the fun stuff. Um, our test statistic at 21.24 is pretty high, and our p-value is quite low, and therefore is showing that donor is significantly correlated with a difference in the unweighted unifrac metric, right? Um, so that gives us really our answer, right? We have quantified difference here, and we've confirmed that donor does make a difference. Um, and as we come down here, these plots give us a nice visual picture of what those distances look like. Um, here, we are looking at distances from healthy control samples to healthy control samples, and from Parkinson's mouse samples to healthy control samples. Here, we are looking at the distances from those Parkinson's mice to Parkinson's mice and healthy controls to Parkinson's mice. On our y-axis is our distance. On our x-axis are the groups that we're testing. Um, and the box plots that you see are implemented, I believe, in the same way as the alpha group significance box plots, where you have the 25th percentile of our samples, the 50th, the median, the 75th percentile, and then out here we have our outliers, which are I think 150% of the interquartile range. Um, each one of these dots does represent an outlier sample, and you can see pretty quickly that, that we do have a sizable difference in the way this data is structured. When we look at weighted unifrac, we have many of the same things happening up here, still have a significant p-value, there's a difference correlated with donor. We're still running a permanova test with 999 permutations, but you can see that these plots are maybe, maybe a little bit closer together, um, which reflects pretty well what we saw in our emperor plots. So before we leave these plots behind, there are a couple of nice features I want to show you. First, they give us the ability to pull down our visualizations as PDFs with a click right there or right there. Um, and we can also pull down the raw data in a TSV format. I don't think I've spent any time with you guys looking at provenance graphs during these tutorials. So we'll take just a moment to look at this. Um, I'm sure somebody else has already walked you through one of these, but when you're using Q2View, it's really easy to visualize kind of the process whereby you arrived at the visualization you produced. These graphs move from top to bottom, first steps to last. You have an import process here. And each step of the way, inside the circle, you have the type, format, and unique identifier of the artifact or visualization that was produced. So here you can see that we pulled in our demultiplex seeks and a reference database. We ran data2, which produced uh, sorry, which produced a feature data and a feature table. And allowed us to start building a reference phylogeny, calculating our distance matrices, and creating the visualization that we've been looking at here. 
which visualization helped us answer a really important question, um, showing that there is indeed a connection between donor and uh, both weighted and unweighted unifrac beta diversity metrics. You'll notice down in the questions here, uh, the first question is, is there a significant effective donor? And I think it's pretty, pretty safe to say we've checked that off the list as a resounding yes. I am going to next run these commands um, also using the beta group significance visualizer. And you'll notice before we run them that there's an additional argument this time. We are using p pairwise. Um, and when you think about the data that we're visualizing, up here it's donor, where we have control and experimental groups. Down here it's cage, and we clearly have a, a much larger number of cages than two. Um, so using p pairwise allows us to pairwise test individual differences between cages and see how cage differences influence difference. So I pasted these into Secure Shell, hit Enter, and you guys know the dance by now. You've done this a few times. Produced the two visualizations shown here. We'll flip back over to our browser, refresh. We see we've got some, some nice new things to play with. An unweighted Unifrac cage significance, which we can copy. and paste in. And a weighted unifrac cage significance. Again, I'm just right clicking, copying and pasting. And most of this visualization will look very familiar to you. You'll notice that the number of groups has jumped from two to six because we have six cages. Um, You'll notice that we still have this uncorrected p-value of 0 0.001. But as you come down, you'll notice that we have many, many more plots. There's a lot more to work with here, right? Um, and you can see that each one of these plots represents the distances from some cage to the cage listed at the top of the title. Distance from samples in C31 to C31 distances from samples in C35 to C31, C42 to C31, so on and so forth. Um, and as we look at this y-axis, remember, higher numbers here indicate dissimilarity. They indicate difference, um, distance. And lower numbers indicate similarity. So these, these um, we would expect to see less distance between the samples in cage 31 and the samples in cage 31. Uh, but there is clearly a pattern here where some of these plots, I'm going to zoom out a little bit so you can see them all together. Some of these plots show up with much higher levels of unweighted unifrac diversity than others. Um, in fact, the trend seems to be that they split right down the middle. There's a group of three in each of these visualizations that is different from the other group of three. Um, that doesn't mean a whole lot statistically yet. I'm kind of just looking at pictures and trying to figure out what I see. But fortunately, we also have the statistics to answer those questions in a quantitative way. Because we passed the p pairwise argument, I'm sure you remember, to the beta group significance visualizer, we have a whole new table at the bottom of our visualizations. 
Um, and that table lists the pairwise comparisons between each group and each of the other five groups, right? So here we have a comparison between cage 31 and cages 35, 42, 43, 44, 49, etc. Each with its own sample size, permutation, pseudo f, p value, and also new here, a q value, just like in alpha group significance. This is a Benjamini Hochberg correction. Um, you'll notice that these q values tend to be higher than the p values because they have corrected for multiple testing bias. We see the same thing over in our weighted unifrac cage significance. Similar visual trends, a little less distance perhaps here. Um, we still have a, an uncorrected significant p-value for um, all of the comparisons. But it's probably more interesting to start asking questions about what these pairwise results might mean. And if we step back over to our tutorial, we'll see that we actually have a really well put together question here. Um, from the metadata, we know that all of the mice with transplants from a given donor were co-housed with other mice transplanted from that donor, right? Which means that all of the C31, C35, and C42 mice have the same donor, and all of the C43, 44, and 49 mice have the same donor. So we might expect a significant difference between uh, cages where the donor is different. Um, and this visualization wouldn't account for that. So we can go back in and look and see whether donor is potentially a part of why we see such a strong difference between these samples. Um, or these groups, rather. I have, I have some little paper notes here so I can remember what our numbers look like. Um, C31, C35, and C42 were all from one donor. And if I look to the right, I see that our Q value comparing C31 and C35 is not significant. We don't see a lot of difference in weighted unifrac between those two cages that have the same donor. The same lack of significance is true between cages 31 and 42. As soon, though, as we get to differences between cage 31 and 43, 44, or 49, we start to see a higher level of difference, um, all three of these being statistically significant. And so maybe what we're seeing here is not so much difference based on cage effect as it is difference based on the donor who contributed to the mice in each of those cages. As such, I would say that the results do look the way that we would expect, um, especially having seen such a strong level of significance when we looked at the, um, the donor influence, the association between donor and unifrac distance. So there is one other box we kind of have to check here when we're working with Permanova. Um, and the tutorial does a really good job of explaining that. Essentially, Permanova differences can be caused either by large differences between groups or by differences and variances within groups. And so in order to, uh, to know that our, our statistically significant differences are meaningful, we also need to confirm that, um, that those differences are not just an artifact of within group variance. We can use beta group significance again, but using a different method this time, PermDisp instead of PermANOVA, um, to really quickly check 
whether we are dealing with that kind of confounding variable in our test. I have once again copied the command. pasted it into our terminal, hit enter, and hopefully we'll have a new visualization shortly. Maybe I'll hit enter again. All right, we're in business. We'll refresh. I don't actually remember what this one's called. This is why typing in your own commands is useful. Um, so we are looking at unweighted unifrac cage significant dis say cage significance disp this time. Do the old copy paste, and we can once again see all of our box plots. What we're looking for here, though, really is summarized well in our, in our summary table at the top. Um, what we want to know is whether there is a significant difference in variance for any of the cages. And this p-value here at 0.19 is high enough to tell us that there, that there is no statistically significant difference between cages, which is great. It means that we've ruled out uh, a high dispersal, I think it is, dispersion rather, um, from being the, the cause of our uh, significant permanent results. This brings us to the last command in our beta diversity tutorial section. This is Adonis. And I am once again going to copy paste. And while this runs, we can talk about what's being passed into this command. Um, here we are once again taking in a distance matrix. This is just a Triumph 2 artifact of the type distance matrix. This one was again produced by Core Metrics Phylogenetic hours and days ago. Um, the same metadata file. It will produce this visualization that we've called unweighted Adonis. And just like we saw back in the alpha, uh, the alpha diversity section, we're using an R style formula here. And again, just like in the alpha diversity section, I would encourage you, if you don't understand these R like formulas, um, to look at the documentation. So if we head to docs.chime2.org and check out our available plugins, go down to diversity, and we are looking for Adonis. We have a nice description of how model formulas work. Now Adonis is a, another multivariate method. Um, and here we're using our formula to try to answer the question um, once, once we take interactions between donor and genotype into account, are either or both of those factors still st statistically significant contributors to beta diversity? I think by now our visualization has finished running, so I will refresh this and we'll take a look at what we've got if I can find it. There we go. Copy our link. Open up Q2 view. And this, refreshingly, is the simplest visualization probably of the entire day. Um, it, it is a, a lovely statistical table that hides a lot of really beautiful and complex mathematics underneath it. Um, and all we need to worry about here are the numbers. We'll use those numbers to answer the last question for this section. 
um, which is really exciting. It's been a long session again, um, and we've covered a lot of ground. One of the things that keeps coming up, right, is this idea that donor has a very strong signal in our data. Um, and like we saw in the conversation about cage effect earlier, it's possible for a factor with a strong signal to kind of outweigh other factors in how we, we perceive diversity in a system. Um, so using a multivariate tool like Adonis lets us kind of tease apart those differences. Here, we want to know if we adjust for donor in using Adonis, do we still have an effect from genotype? And if we do, what percentage of variation does that genotype effect explain? Um, I am not a statistician. I, I will never be, try as I might. Um, but this is a pretty straightforward table. We have listings for the degrees of freedom, the sum of squares, the mean squares, all of which are used in calculating this F statistic, our F model, right? Um, we have R squared, which we'll talk about in just a moment. And we have the probability that this model could generate a more extreme F. Um, this is, again, a p-value that allows us to kind of quantify how likely it is that we got this result. Um, I'm, I'm sorry to all of the statisticians in the audience while I, while I butcher your discipline. Um, so if what we want to know is after adjusting for donor, whether genotype has an effect, all we need to do is look for the genotype factor in row one and note that we have a, a solid significant p-value here. Um, so genotype retains a statistically significant effect even once we tease out any influence from donor. Um, and it explains, and this is where R squared comes in, um, R squared describes the percentage of, that, of the overall diversity that is explained by this factor. Um, and genotype explains 4.7% roughly of our unweighted unifrac. Uh, that doesn't sound like a whole lot, but stepping back for a moment, think about the complexity of a microbial system, right? You have so many different potential influences. Um, so unless you're working with a, like a prepared environment, there are probably many, many, many different factors that go into or that contribute to how this community is structured, right? Um, we here are trying to look at things like genotype and donor. We've controlled for species, um, and we have these animals in a controlled environment, but there's still a lot of different factors that, co that come into play here, right? Um, and so it's very common to see low R-squared values. And though 4.7% isn't a tremendous amount of difference to explain, we'll take it. This is there. This is, this is going to be just fine. Um, this is a publishable result, probably, assuming our everything else about our analysis goes well and our experiment was well designed. Um, so we have answered our last question here. And really, this is one of the most fundamental questions we're asking here. If this study was intended to test whether genotype significantly influences, or at least is significantly associated with um, changes in the microbial community composition or characteristics. We have a really strong result here showing that, yes, indeed, even after factoring out donor, which is a kind of major, another major covariate, um, we still have a statistically significant difference coming from genotype. And a relatively solid percentage of that difference explained by genotype. So as I said, this has been a really long session. Um, I hope you all are holding on OK. But we've done some really cool things here. Um, among them, we got to play around with emperor plots in depth, really see what some of the powerful things you can do with those visualizations are, and start using them to really understand trends in our data that we might not have seen without a good visualization. Um, we got to use a few new commands, Chime Diversity Beta Group Significance and Chime Diversity Adonis among them. Um, and Beta Group Significance, we got to use in a few different ways, looking at pairwise differences, 
using a dispersion test um, to essentially check our own work. Um, and in the end, we found out that there are significant differences by both donor and genotype in our community's beta diversity. Thank you all again for spending some time with me here. I hope this has been helpful and feel free to ask any questions that you might have using the, the question system we've got in place. Have a great day and enjoy the rest of the workshop.